you might remember this this is the high pack player uh the background music machine and when i made the video about this we found out that it was playing slow and inside there was a capacitor that could be swapped out depending upon 60 hertz or 50 hertz and i asked the question in the video last time it will swap in this capacitor change the speed or is this just something that should be changed once you've replaced something else that changes the speed so basically does the capacitor affect the speed because my thing was running slow so all my cartridges sounded like like everyone was drunk uh, i wanted them speeding up to the correct speed i've already got a high pack player uh, which i could use but i thought it'd be nice to get this thing working properly anyway in the comments got lots of people answering that question now i'll pop on the screen at the bottom here now all the people who said no it won't affect the speed remember i don't know I, i'm just an amateur when it comes to stuff like this i can maybe swap the odd belt if i'm lucky uh, and if i'm unlucky even that won't work but yeah lots of people telling me no swapping a capacitor isn't going to change the speed of a motor which is something that i thought seemed a little bit odd as well like how can a capacitor affect the speed of a motor and then there were also all the people on well on the other side who said yes it will so i'll put those across the screen now so these are the people who say yes it will uh, affect the speed if you swap the capacitor for the other one the speed will speed up and therefore it'll play at the right speed again i don't know who's right here there were more people on the yes side than the no side but the people on the no side a lot of them seem very definite that no it will definitely not work and then on the yes side a lot of people were like, yes it definitely will work so i mean there's only one thing worse than no advice and that's bad advice and i don't know who's giving me bad advice here but then i've got to say on the yes side of things there were people arguing by the way with the yes people even though somebody say yes it will work somebody from the no side comes over and says no you're wrong it won't work so it's all this going on and i'm like oh no, 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 does it work or not that's all i need to know i was hoping everyone would come back with yes a big like load of people like you know ask the audience and it comes 99 percent say yes it will work so um, i was like mm, i don't know and still not too sure when i first put it up on patreon there was a nice chap called jeremy he explained that he's done stuff like this before in the past with sony reels reels this is how they vary the speed before they use some kind of timing circuits or whatever so yeah you have different capacitors for different speeds on the sony reel to reels which seem like a you know, like a proof of of concept and then a nice chap uh sparky projects he went to the effort of putting together a video explaining how it all worked i didn't understand it but he seemed convinced he seemed to know what he was on about and you know you get people you go well i know that guy knows what he's on about even though I don't know what he's on about, you know, flying over here. So thanks to Sparky, I thought, right, I'm going to get this sorted out. So I, I asked Sparky a question under his video. I said, right, what capacitor do I want? Because even there was a bit stupid. I didn't know that it didn't matter about the voltage. You just had to get it above the voltage that it required. It was a 220 volt cap, cap in here. And I was searching around for 220 volt caps, 0.1 microfarad or whatever it was. And I couldn't find them anywhere. And uh, it turns out I didn't need to get 220 volts. I could have got a 450 volts one, which is what I got. He linked me to one that he recommended. So I got that one. So the job was open this up again replace the capacitor in there and see if it affects the speed first off i think i should just play you a little section as to what it sounded like with the speed as it was without any alteration okay so that's what it sounds like and i can tell even though i'm not familiar with the song that is running slow now just a couple of other bits of advice i got one was people suggested that i should try and put the belt in the system on a different part of the pulley there'll be a wider section of the pulley to adjust the speed uh no there wasn't in this there was just one position for the belt there was the motor at the end there was the flywheel and it just went in one place you couldn't move it up or down i've dealt with different size pulleys in different things in the past uh in the uh in a record player i've messed around with something like that uh the phillips uh, cassette changer there was a pulley in included in there that you can swap out not in this one and then another bit of advice was that i should use a pure sine wave inverter converter thing you know when you get like a 12 volt battery or power source and you run it through these to up it to the voltage that you need so i'd have to get like a one that worked on 50 hertz 100 volts uh, no the output 60 hertz 100 volts so i'd have to kind of get an inverter pure sine wave from japan i suppose to run this 
Now, truth is, I made a video about this back in 2016 explaining how you do that and how that works, but I showed at the time it was only a temporary solution. And I'll just switch both of these things on. I will mention they both have fans inside them, so it's not the kind of thing you want to leave on all the time, but it's great for me to use for demonstration purposes. I mean, there's all these wires going everywhere. And really, if I could just open this thing up, swap out a cap, have it run at the right speed, why try and run it off all these kind of temporary, messy wires? It's not really ideal. Yeah, something like that is fine. For a quick demo, if I'm showing something in a video, I need it to work for all of five minutes. I could wire that up and say, look, here it is working at the right speed. But if it's something that you want to run for hours and hours and hours, playing tapes, you don't want to be leaving all that around. So yeah, we're going to open this up. We're going to swap out the cap. We're going to see if it makes any difference. Fortunately, after having this thing open before, I now know how to get to the cap. It's just under this bottom cover, and I need to cut that plastic coating off there so I can get to the legs on this. I want to put my discharge tool on here for capacitors. If there's any charge left in this, the lights on that box will light up, and then they will gradually dim as it discharges, but there's no charge in it at all. Now, here's the cap that Sparky Projects recommended. So that's one I decided to use. It's got these long wires, and I was wondering about cutting those off and putting the cap a bit nearer. And then I thought, no, I can run it over to this section on the left here and just run the wires up to the legs, although I will need to cut this protrusion off the back of the plastic because I want to lie this flush inside the case. I'm going to be holding it down with double-sided 3M adhesive tape, but before I do that, I've got to snip out the old capacitor. Rather than lift the circuit board out and desolder it, I thought it'd just be easier to solder those wires to the existing legs that had been on the previous cap, and those are nice and firm. Now, this is either stupidity or confidence, but I'm going to tape this thing down and put the cover on before I test it. So there's a space for it there. I'll just put the cover back in position, and then I realised that space was where the back of the speaker was supposed to fit. I'd forgotten all about the speaker. Never mind, I can just lift the capacitor up, move it a centimetre to the right, and then both will fit. Unfortunately, now it's taped down, so I need to use my pen knife to lever it up. So that was exciting, and here's you waiting for me to knock that glass of water over and electrocute myself, and I nearly do it in a different way. As it was, I didn't feel that at all, it was just bridging two contacts. And this is with the device unplugged for a while as well, so there was something in there holding a residual charge, no doubt a capacitor. Fortunately, no harm done, hopefully. Cover back on, let's see if this thing works. I'm going to use that same cartridge that I played before, and we'll see if it sounds any different this time. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely playing quicker. Of course, I'm not familiar with the song, but what I am familiar with is the sound of my own voice. So I'm going to play back a cartridge that I recorded previously, and we'll see if I sound any different. OK, I'm just turning on the microphone there. I think I've got to talk really loudly into this. I've probably got the wrong impedance of microphone, so excuse me if I'm shouting a little bit. And just for comparison, here's that tape when I originally recorded it in the previous video with the machine with its original capacitor in place. OK, I'm just turning on the microphone there. I think I've got to talk really loudly into this. I've probably got the wrong impedance of microphone. So excuse me if I'm shouting a little bit. So I think it's quite clear from that demonstration that replacing the capacitor does indeed increase the speed. Now that I've got the machine working, I've got more incentive to go through all these high pack cartridges and get them fixed up. Although, I'll be honest, most of these don't look like they're going to be that exciting. I believe it's all Enka music, or most of it is. There's a few more contemporary things in here. That one there looks a little bit more modern. <laughs> I mean, you know, modern in the loosest possible sense. Modern in the sort of early 1970s sense. So let's have a look at that cartridge. I'm sure it'll be knackered like all the others. Yeah, there we go. Right, so behind the tape there, we've got the two pressure pads, I suppose you call them, sponge pads, whatever. They're two part things and it's the lower part that's failed on it. Let me just take it out. So if we just take both of those out there, they just fall out as you can see, there's nothing really holding them in. That's what was holding them in, that dust, that's what should have been holding them. So what we've got here, we've got like a felt pad on this side, but underneath there's supposed to be some sponge. So that's like the springy part, and then this is the part that the tape pushes against. So it's like a two-part thing. Now, there's no point, therefore, just sticking that back on, because I'm missing the sponge section underneath, which is just completely evaporated, well, disappeared, turned to dust. Now, I did make the mistake of buying some replacement pads. I got the wrong ones. Let me find them. There they are. Right, so I got some of these adhesive pads. They look like those there, a little bit thicker. 
These are designed to replace the pads in an 8-track. Not all 8-tracks though, there are some 8-tracks that they made where the pads are on metal spring-loaded arms. So I tried some of these and it just didn't work, the tape wasn't getting pushed up against the heads properly, so the tape was spinning but you couldn't hear anything. So, waste of time getting hold of those, so I went back to my old solution, which I've uh, used for years now, and it's this stuff, it's like draft excluder. This is what I've used on eight tracks and various other things, four tracks and goodness knows what else. Anything that has uh, a tape running against a, a, a layer here but needs a bit of sponge behind it. Let me cut you a bit of this off to show you. Now this stuff, I don't think I'll be able to get hold of it anymore. Fortunately I bought quite a lot back in the day. It came from Klaas Olsen in the UK, and as you can see, it's not the kind of thing they normally sell in the UK with that label on it. Klaas Olsen unfortunately closed down in the UK, or at least they all did the ones that I could get to. There might be the odd one here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, ca I can't get this stuff anymore, but I bought loads of it. I've got enough to set me up for life there. I've got two rolls there, and I've only used this amount of this one so far, so I think I'll be all right. But um, yeah, so here's how this works. So we've got an adhesive back here, a sponge layer and then a plastic coating. I don't know if you can see that reflecting there. So the tape glides across this but also has that layer of sponge in the middle. Perfect stuff. Really adhesive as well, really sticky. Now when those pieces were originally put in there they were adhesive backed and you might be able to just make out the backing that's left inside here. I'll just put a bit of tape up there so you can see that square there. That is the adhesive section so that would have had the sponge on it and it's gone now. Now fortunately that quite often just comes off in one or two goes. If you scrape it from the edge, with it being like a film of plastic, it should all just come up. And this is very similar to what you get in, in a lot of 8-tracks, a similar kind of thing. So you can usually get it out quite easily. All I need to do now is to cut a bit of this tape off here. Now I've been using my um, scissors on the pen knife. I find it's a lot easier than using big ones. So if I just cut a section there... Okay, so I've got my two adhesive pads there now, and I just need to pop one of these in here. Now as I'm doing this, I just mentioned last time, when I was talking about the machine, I mentioned it seemed like it had been kept in a humid environment. And of course then I get all the smart, it's Japan! Well, I do have experience of buying lots of things from Japan, and uh, they're not all rusted up in the bottom like this. In fact, this is the only one that has been in that kind of condition and so what I was saying was that I think it's been you know somewhere a little bit unusual you know like uh, somebody suggested maybe in like one of those saunas you know the ones you always see in the films where all the gangsters are sat there with the tattoos who knows but uh there we go we've got that stuck in there now so that is uh, that fix yeah it's not pretty is it I mean you look at that and you think you know you could have done a better job there but trust me all it needs is something to push up against the inside of the tape and these things they kind of do move around a little bit on the top so they don't always look like they're sticking out like that so there you go that's that fixed let's pop it in and have a quick listen you might have noticed earlier that there was quite a bit of buzz present on the audio and that wasn't down to a fault, it was just down to a ground loop hum. I've rearranged things a little bit in here, swapped out the step down power transformer and I've reduced it down quite significantly. There's still a bit there at the moment but it's not as bad as it was and if I put this in a different location I'll be able to eliminate it entirely. Another thing that I sorted out between the previous video and this one was the commercial message slot at the top here. This is the one where you'd record your announcements over the microphone, you'd put them onto this tape at the top and then set to how often you wanted those to play every hour. So the customers say in a store would be listening to all this music here and then every now and then this cartridge would kick in and play an announcement, uh, perhaps telling them there's a sale on or something. Well, when I tried it last time, it wouldn't stop. It just kept playing over and over, never stopping. And I couldn't figure out what the system was to get this to stop. It turns out it is a foil-based tape system. It's just got a different layout in the top. So with a better piece of foil on the tape, I'd put some on last time, but it didn't seem to connect the two points together. But I put a better piece on, it now stops at that piece of foil. However, that tape's a little bit rubbish anyway. It's got all sorts of splices and things in it. So I'm not going to leave that one in there. But yeah, so at the moment I've got it all working. So so if I press on, right, so let's swap out tape one for our tape that we've just uh, fixed up. Now I'm going to change over to the other microphone so you can hear this a little bit clearer.
Right, I'm nervously waiting for it to get to that splice now and to see if it's going to break or not. In fact, it's taken a while. Let's just have a look. Ah, what's going on here? I'm glad I pulled it out of the machine now. I don't know if you can see it's got itself in a bit of a tangle. Yeah, the tape has folded over. Oh, that's not good. It's, it's twisted there like a bow tie. So we've gone from the shiny side there to the matte side there. And of course the matte side is the one that's supposed to be... I think it's the one that's... Oh, we'll have to take this label off now, won't we? See if we can get under here. Well, I think we're just going to have to go into this one and uh, put a hole in the middle. It's a bit of a shame, but there you go. Right, the perils of high pack. Yeah, I've got no idea why that happened, but it did. So we've uh, got it untwisted now. Just going to be a matter of putting it back in the cartridge. Now, compared to an eight track cart, these things are a nightmare to handle because the tape is a lot more delicate. Now this piece of tape here is supposed to rest flat like that on that piece there. Not the easiest thing to, to try and get all these bits lined up before you put the lid back on again. Right, let's give it a go. Let's go on to program two. I think we saved that one just in time, so I'll put the screw back in. Okay, now we still haven't got up to the splice, so I'll have to play it past that and then we'll know that it's working properly. Right, now I think that is the last track, so as soon as this jumps to number two, I'm going to pull the cartridge out, and that should be where the foil is. So we're just waiting now, a bit nervous, because it could snap at this point. Yeah, any second now. Um, it's not happening. Okay, I've left it playing for about an hour. I've come back, we're on number six now, so clearly it does have a metal foil on it after all, but I can see there why it hasn't been connecting. It seems to have oxidized or almost disappeared entirely. So I'll have to put a new foil on this one. Let's just switch this machine off. I'll just show you a bit of a weird quirk here. When you turn it off, it'll jump through all the cassettes to reset itself. So actually, we'll just put it back to the first one so that I can show you what I mean. Right, it'll find the first tape there now. Right, so it's playing that. Now, if I turn the power off, watch this. It's, the power's off, but it's still jumping down through all the tapes. And then it properly switches off. So it does that every time. Anyway, let's get back and fix this tape. Okay, now I've got a roll of sticky back metallic tape here. This is really quarter inch tape designed for eight tracks, but I'll be able to cut it down. The other thing I'll need to do though, I won't be able to just push it down onto here because that sponge is behind it. So I'm going to cut out a piece of this plastic and slide that underneath. By the way, I must apologize for my rather blocked up head. Sorry if it's uh, upsetting anyone. It's upsetting me too. I just have to live with it for the moment. Right, so I just need to put some tape on there now. The trick with this stuff is never to cut all the way through, just to cut through the metal section, because if you cut all the way through, you'll never get the two halves separated. So I just need to make this a look a bit thinner as well. I've got to say this is a bit more difficult with a camera in your face. I think it would be easier if I wasn't trying to film. Well, I think that should work. Let's find out. And after all that, the machine went and swallowed my tape. Just suddenly started playing quickly and it's taken it all inside. I'm just gonna have to cut this whole section out now. I have to be careful to get it all out in one go as well because I don't want it getting stuck inside here. Oh, that, that's gonna snap. Oh dear, looks like I'm gonna have to get inside the machine again to get the rest of the tape out of that mechanism. Oh dear. Well, it turns out it was the foil tape that did it. It somehow got itself caught around here and the whole thing just self-destructed. Oh, what a nightmare. 
Right, I had to take the front off the machine to get to the tape that had wrapped around the capstan inside there. I've managed to get that out now, but it gave me the opportunity to take out the top mechanism, the one on the right here, because we previously saw this one. These are the playback mechanisms. So we've got the playhead, you've got the metal thing there that contacts to tell it to jump down to the next track, and then a micro switch to tell it that there's a cartridge in position. Well, this one has an extra head, and that is the erase head in the middle there. And of course it uses the playhead as a play slash record head. The other difference is the micro switch has two switches on it. There's one at the top, one at the bottom there. Whereas this just has the bottom switch. And the reason for the extra switch is to tell it that there's a cartridge in position that can be recorded on. Because you might remember the top left notch there. If that is cut out of a cartridge, it means that that cartridge can't be recorded on. But if that top notch is filled, then when it goes into here, it would push against that top micro switch and push it back. As it is, this is a normal cartridge, so it hasn't done. But yeah, if this had that notch filled in, that switch will move back into that position. I hope you can see from that demonstration there of how things can go wrong, that getting each and every one of these cartridges up and running and in perfect playing order is really quite a challenge, and it will take me quite some time. And to be honest, I don't think it's going to be worth it for every single one of them, if not the vast majority. But over time, I hope to get them working, but I just need to spend a little bit more time doing it. I think that last one, unfortunately, the foil did come unraveled. And uh, maybe if I'd spent a bit more time trying to make sure it couldn't do that, I wouldn't have damaged that tape. Unfortunately, now I've lost uh, perhaps a minute or so of audio off it, which I mean, isn't the biggest loss in the world, but I don't like damaging anything. So a bit of a shame that, but you know, you live and learn. That means that next time I'll try and do something a little bit different. I don't think I'd even try replacing the foil. It wasn't worth it. I could have just manually switched to the next track on the tape. Uh, however, you know, I don't have to do all this. There's no need for me to listen to the music off these things at all. I've got a, a chap who posted a very helpful comment under the last video that pointed me in the direction of something called streaming music. I don't know if anyone knows about this thing. I haven't heard about it. I've only ever heard about high pack and eight track and four track and nab carts and vinyl and L cassette and mini disc and DCC. And... All right, now this is going to be a weird ending. I mean, the whole thing was a bit weird, wasn't it? But this, this takes a bit of a tangent. First off, I managed to fix that cartridge. I got it all spooled back up again. Well, I say all, obviously not all the tape that was in the cartridge, but a good percentage of it. I probably lost a song or something off the end of it, which is unfortunate. You never like to damage anything, but sometimes it helps to learn from your mistakes. I know what not to do in the future with regards to that metal foil and things like that. It's good to show these things in videos as well. I mean, I could have just edited all that out and made myself look like some kind of hero being able to do everything first time, but it gives the false impression whenever I try and repair anything. I like to show when stuff goes wrong, like when I nearly got electrocuted, uh, because it just gives people a better feeling as to what's involved. If I was just to fix something and go, Brr, there, I fixed it dead easy, no problem. You know, like a video that was like TikTok length, it might give people a false impression that these things are dead easy to do. And really you do need a bit of patience sometimes. And a lot of stuff probably isn't even worth taking the effort over. Now, I'm glad that this went wrong, and that's a weird thing to say, not because I lost the song, it wasn't like a song I hated, but I learned something from this particularly. Let me just put this, <laughs> this is this is bad, let me just put this in here and play it for a second, I'll just switch it on. You see, earlier on I was thinking that I'd adjusted the speed, everything was working perfectly, so just have a listen. <laughs> It's a little bit wobbly. Right, so I'll just stop that there. So when I listen to that cartridge in here, previously, I mean the one with my voice when I'd recorded on it, I'd obviously sped it up by changing that capacitor. I'd sped the earlier song up as well. And this one, I thought, well, it's a bit weird that they got the picture of these ladies on the box and it's some kind of bloke singing. Yeah, well, let me just play it in my, uh, in my car player, high pack player here. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Program two. Yeah, so it's supposed to be ladies singing this. It's not supposed to be a chap. So when I did that repair, 
it sped it up i say repair alteration <laughs> when i did that fix or whatever it is to this swapping the cap out it sped it up it's definitely happened but not enough i've had a bit of an epiphany a light bulb went off i've realized what's going on here so we've replaced that part in this device and it's uh believe it or not now running at the right speed and you might be thinking hold on a minute how can it run at the right speed if that is slower than this thing here with the same cartridges in it well that's the issue it's not supposed to play the same cartridges this came out in the latter part of the 1970s the high pack music format and car stereos to accompany it came out right at the beginning of the 1970s were very unsuccessful and disappeared from the market very quickly all the cartridges that i've got for that earlier system the one that came and went by the time this was launched in the late 1970s everyone had forgotten the previous high pack format this doesn't mention a high pack on it anywhere either on the device itself or in the instruction manual being a background music system it would have its own cartridges that you'd rent or lease for a device like this you'd send them back and you get some more they weren't designed to be playing the original high pack system and that is why the speeds are different Whenever we've seen background music systems in the past, there's a couple of things that tend to be quite common. One is that they're mono. There's no point having a stereo system. It uses up more of the tape than you need. You could duplicate uh, that space and use it for different tracks of audio. So on a four track tape, instead of having two stereo programs, you could have four individual tracks, for example. And on something like this, for example, run the tape at a slower speed that's a quite a common thing it enables you to get more music on each tape because audio on a background music system doesn't have to be high fidelity it just has to be background music so what i suspect is going on here and i'm pretty sure about it now is that this has been designed to run special cartridges that just happen to be the same size and shape as the high pack because why not they already exist i mean it's I've, I've played NAB carts before in the past and you get those at various different speeds. For example, there's a background music cart that runs at a lot slower than one you'd use as a radio DJ, for example. So it's a similar idea. They're using the same cartridge style in a different machine, playing it back in mono and playing it back at a slower speed with recordings that will therefore take longer to get through. So if you fill this thing up with music, it will take a lot longer to get through all that music and background to the beginning because the tapes are running slower. So I think that's what's going on here. So yeah, thanks to everyone who suggested to replace the cap. I've done it. We've got it working at the right speed, the right speed for the wrong tapes. What I'd need now is some Japanese background music carts for whatever system this was called in the latter part of the 70s. I don't know, and it's very unlikely I ever find those. But uh, yeah, so what we've got here are uh, two different formats. We've got a player for one format that I don't own, and we've got the car stereo and all the cartridges that are in the earlier high pack format. So that was a bit of a revelation. Now, I'd just like to add something in here because Hypack was a system that was always intended to have more than one playback speed. You can see along the top of each of these boxes, alongside a number 4 or 10, which indicates the number of songs on the carts, there's an indicator of the playback speed. In this case, they're all 4.8 centimetres per second, and the maximum length the cart should play at that speed is supposed to be about 60 minutes. But there was a plan to also have a 9.5 centimetre a second cartridge. Now, those would only play for 30 minutes, but they would do it at a higher quality. Now, I've never seen any of those, so I don't know whether they ever actually came out. However, I can now see that this background music player took things in the opposite direction. By experimenting with recordings I'd made of the music being played back, it appears the playback speed here has been reduced by 25%, which would give an extra 33% playing time per cartridge. And that is exactly the same speed alteration that I saw in the cassette tape based AEI Pro Pack background music system. So that speed reduction means that a tape cartridge which could previously hold a maximum of 60 minutes of music can now play for approximately 80 minutes and therefore a fully loaded machine with the correct type of background music tapes could play for roughly five and a half hours before the music started repeating. Now, of course, I should mention that by swapping the cap in this machine, I did get it to play at the correct speed for a 50 hertz electricity zone, but that is as far as you should really take that kind of modification. You can't just keep swapping out the cap to increase the speed of the motor. This machine is only supposed to play back those slower background music carts, not the standard 4.8 centimeters a second ones. 
However, that's not an issue as I do own a nice stereo player which works perfectly and plays back all the pre-recorded tapes I own at the right speed. I'm really more interested in the fact that this Crown A800 machine turned out to be evidence of yet another music format and one that I hope to find one day. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed it. I don't know if you have, but it's a bit of a weird video. Um, if you didn't like it, you know, thumb it down. Do what you want. I'm uh, not telling you what to do. I'm not one of those channels that says hit the bell, subscribe. Look, you're a grown adult. You know what to do. It's your computer. You press whatever buttons you want. I'm not in charge of you. Yeah, it's your choice, isn't it? Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.